I love that, don't you? It is true. The Lord has risen. risen. It is true. The Lord has risen. It is true. The Lord has risen. What a way to start your day. What a way to wake up in the morning, every morning, thinking and remembering that the Lord is risen. That it is true. The Lord has risen. How do you start your day? How do you wake up in the morning? Maybe I should ask your husband or your wife how you wake up in the morning. They've offered to give a better answer. Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. It gets pretty deep on Sunday mornings here. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh and Piglet were going for a walk. And uh, it's pretty quiet for a while. And then uh, Piglet turns to Winnie the Pooh and says, uh, When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you think of? Winnie the Pooh thinks for a while and scratches his chin and says, Well, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think of is what's for breakfast. <laughs> Why, what do you think of, Piglet? Piglet turned to him and said, I say, I wonder what exciting thing is going to happen today. <sighs> what a difference, yeah. What a contrast between the two. What about you? When you wake up in the morning, do you think what a what, what wonderful and exciting thing is going to happen today? I mean, I mean that doesn't mean that, that you're always going to have great days, right? I mean, we all have good days and bad days. Sometimes you have good days and bad years, <laughs> you know, or two bad years or more. But, you know, we don't have good things happening to us all the time. Uh, I read a, 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 a sign that a few number of years ago was put in a, a store window in England. It said this, we have been established for over 100 years and have been pleasing and displeasing customers ever since. <laughs> we have made money and lost money. Suffered the effects of coal nationalization, coal rationing, government control, and bad payers. We have been cussed and discussed, messed about, lied to, held up, robbed, and swindled. The only reason we stay in business is to see what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? And isn't that? Isn't that true? Isn't that what it feels like at times? You just kind of, okay, what's around the next corner? What's, what's coming along next that I've got to deal with in this world? Because life is tough, you know? And uh, I know you love my singing, so I, I wanted to remind you of a, of a country song. Don't shake your head like that. Don't let... Remember, Lynn Anderson. I beg your pardon. I never... Along with the sunshine, there's got a... That's right. Good job. Well done. <laughs> Today is not, is not treat. I mean, God doesn't promise us that you're going to have a great day every day. He doesn't promise us that everything's always going to work out in our lives. But he does promise us today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that God has given us. In fact, Jesus even said to us, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. In fact, in... Uh, 1 John chapter 5, the Apostle John, the disciple John, said this, Everyone born of God, that's if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, everybody born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. God wants us to wake up in the morning and wonder what exciting thing God is going to do for us today. To live in victory regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. To be able to say, it is true. The Lord has risen and he's living in me. Is he living in you today? Can you say, can you wake up in the morning and say, it is true. The Lord has risen. These two men were on the road to Emmaus which is about seven miles from Jerusalem to the northwest. And um, they're traveling along the road, and, and 
and the passage in, in the scriptures in verse 17 says, their faces were downcast. They were miserable. They were dejected. I mean, they had followed Jesus. They had listened to his amazing teachings. They would wondered at the things that he taught them. They'd, they'd seen miracles. They'd seen the lame walk and the blind see. But then they saw him arrested. Then they not only saw him arrested, but they saw him brutally beaten and tortured. They saw him crucified on a cross. And they saw him put in a grave, dead. And so they're going on the road to Emmaus. And they're dejected. They are downcast. They're despondent. They're confused. They're confused because they remember Jesus saying something about in the third day he raised again and, and they, the women had gone to the tomb and the tomb was empty. They had this vision of angels saying, why are, you, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He's risen. But then some of our own people went, some of the men went and they saw the empty tomb but they didn't see Jesus. I don't know what's going on, they're thinking to themselves. I, I can't explain it. And we've all had our Emmaus roads, haven't we? Maybe you're on one now. Going down that road in life where you're just not sure the direction you're headed. That Emmaus road where you're not sure about the answers to life. You've got questions, there's problems, and there's difficulties, and you're not sure how long that road is going to be, and it just seems like you're going down it forever, wondering where God is in the midst of it all. So they're walking along, and then all of a sudden, Jesus is walking with them. And the Bible says that they are kept from understanding, from, sorry, from recognizing him. They are kept from recognizing him. Now, that could have been a supernatural thing, I don't know, or it could have been simply Lack of faith. Maybe they just didn't see him because they didn't believe. Have you noticed in your own life when you're struggling with your faith? When you're struggling in some walk in your life, you're struggling with, through a problem or, or a sin in your life or, or whatever it happens to be? It's tough to see Jesus. It's tough to recognize the fact that Jesus actually has his hand on your life. And he wants to bring about things to change you, to change your world. But when we're struggling with our faith, when we're struggling with our life, when we're, when we're downcast, we hardly see Jesus. We have to learn to live in his presence, even when we're going through difficult times. And so Jesus says to them, what are you discussing? <laughs> and they look at each other and they they, they say, are you the only one in Jerusalem <laughs> that doesn't know what's gone on with Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, what's gone on? And they say, he, he, was, a, he was a man of God. He, he did miraculous things. He was a prophet. He, he, he did all sorts of amazing things in this world. And we had hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped. Hoped. I looked up that word in the original language. The word hoped is the word elpizomen. And it doesn't mean trust. Elpizomen doesn't mean faith. It just means hoped. And it's past tense. We had hoped, but it just seems that all our hopes that we had had for this man were buried in a tomb and they are finished. Ever felt like that? Just seems like whatever you've been putting your hope in has just not come to pass. What are your hopes based on? Are your hopes based on what you want in this world or are they based on what you believe God knows is best for your life? Do you truly and honestly put your trust fully in Him, knowing that He has your best interests at heart, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what difficulties you're facing in your life. Jesus said to them, 
You foolish people. I don't know. I, I don't want Jesus saying that to me. But I think, I think he said it a few times <laughs> to me. You foolish people and slow of heart. You know, we foolishly put our trust in all sorts of things, don't we? We put our trust in ourselves. We put our trust in our money, in our homes. We put our trust in our jobs. We put our trust in the fact that we've got money in our bank account, in a retirement fund. We put our trust in stuff, material possessions. We put our trust in careers. We put our trust in the future. We put our trust in people. And the Bible said, well, some people have said, anything less than God will let you down. Anything less than God will let you down. But God will never let you down. When we're going to put our hopes in something, we've got to put our hope in something that is eternal, and that is God and God alone. Put yourself, your trust in Him. We are slow of heart. We are slow of heart to commit ourselves wholeheartedly, completely, fully, 100% to God. Aren't we? I mean, we'll trust Him to a certain degree so far, uh, but not all the way. I'll trust in Jesus, but I'll also trust in my job. I'll trust in Jesus, and I'll also trust in the fact that I can do this and I can do that. It's kind of like what I call a Jesus plus. You know, Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus something else. And, and I'll trust Jesus as, as long as, as it doesn't cost me anything. I'll put my trust fully in Jesus as long as I don't have to change anything in my life. As long as I don't have to start living a new life. I'll put my trust in Jesus as long as, as it isn't painful or difficult. How about you? Will you put your trust in Jesus completely or just when it's convenient? Henry Babus, on, show him. let's try and say it a little bit with a French accent, Henri Babus. I don't know, he's a Frenchman anyway. He's a French writer uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And he, was, he wrote these words about an incident that took place in the First World War in the trenches. In these particular trench that he was in himself, he overheard a discussion taking place between two men. This is what they said. Listen, Dominic, you've led a very bad life. Everywhere, you are wanted by the police. But there are no convictions against me. My name is clear. So, here, take my wallet, take my papers, take my identity and my good name and my life, and quickly, hand me your papers that I may carry all your crimes away with me in death. <sighs> and isn't that exactly what Jesus did for us? that Jesus died, that he might take our old life with him to death. That we might live a new life. That we might have a new identity. An identity that comes from Christ and Christ alone. An identity that comes from him so that we can live forever and that we can live in victory in the resurrection power in this world. But maybe we're a little bit more like Monroe Parker. Monroe Parker is an American evangelist from a number of years back, and he lived in Alabama, and he was traveling through his, his home state, not far from where he lived, and it was one of those really hot, summer, sunny, humid days, kind of what Jill and I are hoping for in a few days' time. <laughs> and he came to this, this uh, fruit stand, and he decided he was going to buy a watermelon. It was so hot. Are you making you thirsty and hungry? He, just, he, he said, I'm going to buy a watermelon. So he went up to the, he said, how much are your watermelon? And the guy said, they're a dollar and ten cents. And he kind of went in his pockets and he, he, said, he said, I've only got a dollar. He said, that's okay, I'll trust you for it. So he said, oh, okay, thank you. Picked up his watermelon, started to walk away. And the guy said, hold on a minute. <laughs> he said, you didn't give me the dollar. <laughs> And Monroe Parker looks at him and says, Hey, Mac, you said you'd trust me for it. He says, Well, you, I'm just trusting you for the dime, not for the dollar. <laughs> I'm expecting you to pay me the dollar. He says, You weren't trusting me at all. 
you had just taken a 10 cent gamble on my integrity and that I'd bring that 10 cents back to you. And you know what? That's a little bit like us as Christians, isn't it, at times? Do we truly trust in God fully, wholeheartedly? Or are we just taking a 10 cent gamble <laughs> that God is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he'll do and that we can truly put our trust in him? So how about you? Are you going to take his identity and become like Christ? Live in the resurrection power of God? Or are you just going to take a 10 cent gamble on God's integrity and kind of live as best you're able? That's the question for today. How much are we prepared to trust in Jesus? Let me ask you, what is stopping you today from putting your trust fully in God? regardless of your circumstances, fully committing your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you three very quick principles to living in resurrection power. The number one is, number one is this, to learn to spend your days in the presence of God. Every day of your life, from the moment that you wake up in the morning to the moment you put your head down on that pillow, to learn to live in the presence of God, to spend time with Him, to see Him, to recognize Him as you walk down your road of life. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult that road might be. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse eight, verses 18 to 20, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which He has called you, His glorious inheritance with the saints and his incomparably great power his incomparably great power for us who believe he says that power is like the working of his spirit that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God what is he saying he says I want you to know the power of God the power of God that raised Christ from the dead and is living in you that you can live in that resurrection power that same power is available to each and every one of us. But in many cases, it's just dormant. It's just kind of sitting there. And we're living in our own strength. Back in Easter of uh, 1973, on April 22nd, Easter Sunday, in a country called Uganda, it was being run at that time by a man by the name of Idi Amin, who ran a, a kind of an awful administration, a land of terror during that time. And still fresh in Sampenge's memory was what he wrote as a face burned beyond recognition. The sight of soldiers cruelly being beaten and a horrible sound of boots crushing bones. All these memories of seeing the terror that Idi Amin inflicted upon his people was crushing and rushing through Kifa Sampangi's mind. He was a pastor and he was about to preach a sermon on Easter Sunday morning. And he was wondering to himself, what good will my sermon do in the midst of all this terror that's going on? He got up that Sunday morning and preached to 7,000 people. After the service, he was overwhelmed with the grace of God. And he walked from his church into the vestry tired but joyful. Five men followed him into the small building and the men closed the door behind them. And as soon as they did, Sampangi turned around and saw five rifles pointed at him. He said their faces were full of pure hate and rage. We are going to kill you, said the leader. If you have something to say, say it now. Sempangi stood there. He said he was feeling himself lose control. He thought of his wife and his child, and he literally began to shake. I do not need to plead my own cause, he said. I am a dead man already. My life is dead and hidden in Christ, so if I die, I'll be alive. It is your lives that are in danger. You are dead in your sin. I will pray to God that after you have killed me, 
he will spare you from eternal destruction. Mm. The leader looked at him kind of curiously. And then he dropped his gun and told the others to do the same. Will you pray for us now, he said. Simpangi was wondering if it might be a bit of a trick. <laughs> so we told them to bow their heads and to close their eyes. <laughs> and then he prayed, Father in heaven, you who have forgiven men in the past, forgive these men also. Do not let them perish in their sins, but bring them unto yourself. And every one of them bowed their knees and received Christ. And they let Sempangi go. We need to learn to live in the presence of God. Whether we get killed or whether we live. Whether we're going through trouble or whether we're going through great times. Whether we're going through a hardship or whether we're on the mountaintop. We need to fully put our trust in Jesus Christ, knowing that he has our best interests at heart, even when we can't see it. Just like those men on the road to Emmaus, they couldn't see that Jesus had his hand on their lives and on the future. And they had to learn to trust in him. In verse 28, it says that Jesus continued on and it looked as though he was going to pass them by. And as he was going on further, they turned to him and said, Stay with us. Don't you like that? Stay with us, he said. And they invited him in to their home. And that's exactly what God wants us to do ourselves. And they broke bread. Not the same way we did it. But they had a meal and they broke bread. And when Jesus gave thanks, their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And all of a sudden he was gone. And they said, weren't our hearts burning within us? As he opened up the scriptures on the road. We need to learn to live in the presence of God. Secondly, we need to fill our lives with the word of God. This word needs to become our life. It needs to become who we are and what we live. And when it does, it will burn our, heart, our hearts inside of us. It will change us from the inside out. We will be changed. This book will change your life forever when you learn to live it and when you learn to allow its words to rest on your life. They will change your life forever. Just like they did to these men on the road to Emmaus. And lastly, in addition to living in the presence of God and making this book your word of life for yourself. We need to spread the word of what God is doing in each and every one of us. Don't you love what happened? Those men, they quickly got up and it says, and they went back to Jerusalem. They could not keep it to themselves. They had to go back. It was late. It was getting dark. You do not travel at night alone in those, in those places. But they couldn't keep this to themselves. They, we got to go back and tell everyone. So they, they rushed back to Jerusalem and they said, it's true. The Lord is risen. It's true. The Lord is risen. And they told them everything that had happened. They were so excited. And when God truly gets a hold of your life and you live in the resurrection power of God, you cannot help but want to tell other people. Just this past week, I never go on Facebook, once in a blue moon, but I read your daughter's, what she put on it. And she was apologizing for not kind of being at our Easter service, but then she said this, I had an incredible Easter at school. Not only was I able to witness to one of my very close friends and making a declaration of his faith through baptism, but also to two friends whom I care for very much came to Christ and accepted him as their savior. And then she went on and said, this past weekend has definitely strengthened my resolve to step out of my comfort zone and be a witness in this world. And when God has got a hold of your life, he will get a hold of Georgina. He'll get a hold of Peter. He'll get a hold of you. And you will not be able to contain yourself and want to tell other people about what Jesus is doing in your life. So learn to live in his presence. No matter what is happening in your life, put your trust fully in him. Make this word your book for life. Make this word dwell within you so that it becomes alive in you. 
Tell others about what God is doing in your life. And you will wake up in the mornings expecting God to do great things in your life. And you will say every morning, it is true. The Lord is risen and he is living in me. Amen? Please stand. And ask the band to come back up here. We're going to sing a song in Christ alone, my hope is found. And that's exactly where our hope has got to be. It's got to be in Christ and nothing but Christ. And when we put our trust fully in Jesus, our lives will never be the same again. And I want to encourage each and every one of you, no matter where your life is at, no matter what road you happen to be on, you, you're on some kind of a Maus road now and it, maybe it seems like God has forgotten you or you've just lost sight of him or whatever it is. You don't recognize him. You don't see his hand at work in your life. But let me tell you today, he's there. He is here and he wants to work in your life. He wants to help you live in victory and he wants to help you live in the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you that you're with us and we pray, Lord, that your name will be glorified in us and through us we pray, Lord, for each and every person in this place, Lord, and whatever road they're going down, I pray, Lord, that we will be able to wake up in the morning and expect great things from your hands. I pray, Lord, that we will live in the resurrection power of God, even though, Lord, we might be going through a tough, tough time in our lives. No, we can know that we can live in victory. And I pray especially, Lord, for those that maybe don't know you as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that right now that they would say with me, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I want to know you, Lord and Savior. Come into my life. I want to live in this power that Peter's talking about. I want it for myself, that I might live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.
It is true, the Lord is risen. And Lord, you are living in each and every one of us. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will help us, Lord, to learn to live in your presence. That, Lord, you would make your word our, our home. That, Lord, we would be able to share the word of God and what you're doing in our lives with others. But most of all, Lord, we pray that we would learn to live in the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That each and every day of our lives we might follow in your steps and walk in your ways. For, Lord, you are our King of kings and our Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all.